Why did medieval people generally cover their hair? Watch on to discover more about medieval headwear, its production, and unexpected uses. The reality of pre-modern Europe is that people tended to cover their hair for a variety of very good reasons that extend beyond fashion. Although really, when it comes to adorning oneself, does one really need a practical reason? I say nay. Anyway, sartorial expression aside, on a practical level, headwear can provide insulation from heat and cold and sun. You have to remember that medieval and Renaissance homes could get quite cold in the winter, especially in any rooms that did not have fireplaces, and most homes did not feature such amenities until the 18th century. Covering one's head was thus a way to help retain heat, which is why one sees so many depictions of medieval people bathing with their heads covered and even sleeping with covered hair. In fact, there are even sleeping caps and in inventories. Inversely, in the summer, a white koi veil or straw hat will reflect the light of the sun, thereby helping wearers maintain a comfortable body temperature. And I know many modern medievalists who soak their coifs in cold water and place them on their head to encourage evaporative cooling in brutal climes. Yours truly included. But coifs, which are made of linen or sometimes even silk, can also possibly serve to keep one's hair cleaner. One must consider the air quality indoors in the medieval world. As implied earlier, in-home chimneys did not make an appearance in Europe until around the 12th century, and were not widely dispersed until after the medieval period. Imagine having a fire in the middle of your floor, with the smoke filling your house with a heady blend of soot and other particulate matter. Good times for lungs. Which will also make one's hair most unpleasant after not long, especially in combination with the natural oils of your scalp. And when one does not have running water, let alone hot water, to hand, one does not simply wash one's hair every day, let alone fully bathe. I mean, I suppose there are some humans who enjoy dunking their warm bodies in the freezing cold, yet readily available water of lakes and streams. Looking at you, Finnish and Swedish friends, but I digress. And even though feasible, hair washing over a basin can become an um, hmm, adventure when using a pitcher of water to rinse. Video on that amusing process coming soon. Not to mention the requisite drying time for the long hair that women usually had. And in an unheated home in winter, oh, just imagine how joyful that would be. And yes, medieval combs with their closely spaced tines do go a long way towards helping remove detritus from hair. Yet there's only so much a comb can do when faced with the real serious grime that could result from prolonged exposure to soot and or dust from fields and roads. Thus, particularly for people engaged in manual labor, a coif could therefore help keep one's locks lovelier and more pleasant, or at least delay the need for a proper washing. And medieval people were fastidious about cleanliness. Let no Victorian snob deceive you on that score. Interestingly, one can pretty neatly correlate the proliferation of chimneys with the rise of exposed hairstyles, with Italian city-states really leading that charge. In fact, according to records, an earthquake destroyed a number of chimneys in Venice in 1347. Yeah, it, it was an all-around bad year for Venice. Anyway, back to headwear. Beyond these highly practical applications, in certain times and places, head coverings could also be utilized to denote certain identities, whether religious identity, age, gender, or marital status. In places like Florence, for instance, unmarried women, especially adolescent ones, exposed their beautifully coiffed hair when in public spaces, while married women covered their likewise intricately wrought tresses with silk and linen coifs and veils. Covered hair was therefore a visual sign that a lady was off the proverbial meat market. The practice of women in Europe covering their heads with a coif or veil may also have scriptural origins as well. For example, the admonishment by famous misogynist Paul of Tarsus, who wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians. But I will that ye wit, that Christ is the head of each man, but the head of the woman is the man. Each woman praying or prophesying, when her head is not healed, defileth her head. For it is on, as if she were pulled. And if a woman be not covered, be she pulled. And if it is a foul thing to a woman to be pulled, or to be mad pallid, heal she her head. In some polities, there was even laughable legislation in place to regulate how women dress themselves, specifically mandating that they cover their hair because men have been trying to control women's bodies for centuries. And because, you know, women are so easy to control. Anywho. Bologna was such a place, for instance. On September 30th, 1279, Cardinal Latino Malabranca issued a set of regulations for his entire legation, consisting of six chapters. One, on people who illegally occupy churches. Two, on the visitation of monasteries. Uh-huh, I wonder why they had to pass that one. 
Three, against clerical concubines, the inevitable consequence of forbidding priests to marry. <laughs> well, my God, people, okay. Four, on granting and remitting penance. Five, on indulgences. Well, that was going to lead to a big problem. And six, on the dress of women. In his chronicle, Fra Salimbeni tells us that Latino issued this tough ordinance on female dress in his campaign to quell the sort of factional strife that so characterized the Italian city-states of this era. Imagine the competitiveness of modern football teams during the championship, but you know, with weapons and trained men-at-arms. Good times all around. He also banned long trains, which I swear it was not one of my dresses that inspired this ban and also required all women to veil their faces when they left home. As happens with all sumptuary legislation, Cardinal Latino's regulation of female attire was denigrated, bemoaned, and utterly disregarded, and also led to women designing veils that were increasingly ornate. Who could have seen that coming? In other places, covering one's hair was a sign of an honest woman, meaning not a prostitute actress or acrobat, you know, the unholy trio of medieval immorality. For example, if a respectable woman from the French town of Arles spied a prostitute wearing a veil, she was apparently legal entire titled to rip it off. The association between head coverings and respectable women can even be seen in this manuscript illumination depicting a female cadaver and her anatomy. Even though every part of her, inside and out, is exposed, the artist has still portrayed her in a veil and wimple, thereby maintaining her dignity and respectability in the eyes of the reader. One wonders if hair became sexualized because women kept it covered for practical purpose, or if it was covered because it was already sexualized. Chicken and age epistemology for the win. In contrast to, or perhaps in support of, the strictures governing women's head coverings and the identity function involved, the symbolism of the bareheaded maiden was tied to the Virgin Mary and purity in the medieval world. You will notice that in many images, she is depicted with her tresses flowing, pate saucily uncovered. And in fact, the same symbolism then made appearance in certain rituals and ceremonies of the Middle Ages, specifically coronations. In the Liber Regalis, an English book of royal ceremonies from the 14th and 15th century, English queens are instructed to be bareheaded and her hair must be decently laid down onto her shoulders. And she shall wear a circlet of gold adorned with jewels to keep her hair the more conveniently in order on her head. The symbolism here is, of course, that the queen is assuming a new personage, in essence, from a ritualistically virginal state to marrying the kingdom and the people. In fact, many contemporary depictions of the Virgin Mary would seem a verbatim interpretation of these instructions. Interestingly, in that same book of ceremonies, a coif is used to cover the queen's head after anointing with holy oil, so she comes bareheaded and leaves with a coif and a crown. And no. There seem to be no equivalent signs of bachelorhood for men in this era, at least none that I could find, but let me know in the comments if you have evidence of sartorial symbols of male bachelorhood. Anyway, coifs were also used ceremonially for the coronation of English kings as well. Check out this interesting tidbit from the Liber Regalis. Then he shall be clothed in the Colobium Sindonis, shaped like a domatic, after his head has been covered with a coif on account of the anointing. The coif is to remain continuously on the king's head for seven days. And on the eighth day, after the consecration of the king, one of the bishops shall celebrate a mass of the Trinity before the king in the church or in his chapel. And after mass, the bishop shall take the coif from the king's head and shall wash the king's head carefully with hot water. And after washing and drying, he shall reverently arrange the king's hair. Then he shall put the golden circlet on the king's head with all honor. And the circlet shall be worn all that day by the prince, bareheaded in reverence of his cleansing. So here, as like with the pure Virgin Mary, the king being freshly cleansed, ritually and figuratively, is permitted and even expected to keep his, bare, his head bare. The fact that they stipulate this bareheadedness indicated just how uncommon it must have been for men or to wear nothing upon their pates. Linen coif could range from a simple rectangle of fabric tied in the back of the head to carefully tailored items that frame the fleece beautifully. There were, of course, periods of time and polities in the Middle Ages in which men of a certain social class might fully expose their neatly coiffed hair. One notes this especially in the 14th century. But this is nearly always in combination with a very well-kempt hairdo and a hooded cowl, which presumably could be raised to perform all of the aforementioned functions and perhaps even more. Woolen hoods are great against rain, for instance. Well, until they aren't, that is. Uh -huh, the magical properties of woolen water. So. Wearing a lovely hair covering is all very well, but what about the production of hats, coifs, and veils? 
Thanks to anally fastidious medieval record keeping, we actually have a fairly good picture, including tax rolls, guild laws and records, and household account books. And you thought that no one would ever be interested in your tax returns. Anyway, this soporific body of evidence indicates that while men were often the hatters, mad or otherwise, call, veil, and coif making fell predominantly in the female domain. In 13th century France, for instance, the women veil makers in the tax and guild records are often referred to as coiffières or crespinières. The tax rolls and statutes of guilds even indicate that these were often of linen or silk. Paris even featured a street called the Rue Coiffurier. And it was not just Christian women, but Jewish women from this era are also listed in the records as being both coif makers and milliners and veil makers. I guess that's actually three things. So all of these things. Along these lines, the express accounts of Philip the Good, renowned Duke of Burgundy, and the wardrobe accounts of Henry VII of England feature a number of line items for payments to women for linen and silk coifs, some for the gentlemen and some for the ladies, not to mention hundreds of entries for bonnets, chaperones, caps, a tour, corn, and other delightful headgear. So, have I convinced you as a medievalist to cover your head in some appropriate fashion? Do you like or loathe head coverings? And why? Let me know in the comments below. And shameless plug, if you would like to learn to wear this sort of coif, I offer workshops on a regular basis where we go through it together step by step and you start with linen and you end with this. And all sessions are recorded, so if you miss any of them, you can catch up at your leisure. Check out thecreativecontessa.com for this and a variety of other fun classes that I offer, workshops, hands-on things, etc. Okay, well, shameless plug over. Stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of kitty. <laughs>